Who's been enjoying our Genuine series? So good. So today, I'm going to be talking all about true Christian community, right? So if you're taking notes, the title of my message today is, Did God Send Them Into Your Life? And so I love the early church. I love how the reason behind why the early church did community was not because, you know, they were really similar or they were in similar seasons or they had shared interests. That might have been a result of community, but that was not why they came into community. And so in Acts 2 verse 42, it's a powerful verse, right? Let me read it out. It says, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Now, the word fellowship there, it comes from the Greek word koinonia. And what koinonia means, it means to have in common or to share, not in your similar interests, but to share in the life of Christ in a way that brings about both individual and spiritual corporate growth. Now, that is the essence of true Christian community, right? And I love that in the body of Christ, we're also different. We've got different strengths, different personalities, and that's what makes a body, right? We all work together for the cause of Christ. And so in 1 Corinthians 12, 17, it really illustrates this pretty well. It says, if the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? So you see, unlike in the world where, you know, generally people do life together because they're similar or they've got, you know, similar interests, In the body of Christ, we recognise that God calls us into community, not from a place of uniformity because we're all so different, but rather from a place of divine alignment, right? And so if you study the context of koinonia just a little bit further, uh, generally and largely from the book of Acts, you'll understand the koinonia was actually uh, a non-optional environment for spiritual growth. Deep community is non-optional, right? So in other words... When you're doing true Christian community, it's not like an ideal that you probably should have, but rather it's a reality that you need to operate in. And uh, I don't know, right? Maybe you walked in here after about a couple of months into church and you're going, oh, look, I got to keep, I got to show face, keep it hot. Or maybe you're a little bit like me a couple of years ago and I'd sort of text a few people just to keep their relationship hot, right? How's that going for you spiritually? And don't get me wrong, your spiritual intimacy is completely dependent on your relationship with Jesus Christ. But there is so much that God will choose to do through other people in your life that you might be missing out on purely because you're rejecting to be in true Christian community. So I want to give us three quick identifiers today on how to tell if God is sending people into your life to be in true Christian community with. So the first one, true Christian community will instill uncommon faith. Now, if you don't know the story of where Peter walks on water, it's a good one. I want to read it out, right? In Matthew 14, verses 28 to 31, it says, And Peter answered him, Lord, if it's you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took a hold of him, saying to him, Oh, you of little faith, Why did you doubt? Now, in situations where God might give you a word or a vision and he might have confirmed it to you a couple of times and you're going, wow, this is really big and it's pulling out every ounce of faith in you to believe it. Generally, it's a level of faith that you're currently not operating at, right? And it might take someone that God might need to send into your life or a group of people who are either operating at this level of faith or beyond this level of faith to unlock an uncommon level of faith in you. Now to them, this required level of faith that you're being called to operate at, it won't be uncommon to them, but it is going to be uncommon to you. Now, if we think about the story, right? When Jesus addresses Peter, he addresses his level of faith. He says, Peter, you have little faith. He doesn't say, Peter, you have no faith. Peter had enough faith to walk on water. But when he saw the winds, which required a higher level of faith, he gave into doubt and began to sink, right? But it was definitely an opportunity for Peter to operate at a high level of faith. If Jesus hadn't even given him the instruction to come, Peter would have never even known he was being called to that level of faith, right? Jesus was obviously operating at a level of faith that was completely uncommon to Peter. And he was trying to unlock that in him. And I love how in the Bible, it describes faith at being at different levels, right? Jesus talks about faith being the size of a mustard seed enough to move mountains. That's a level of faith. And on a couple of occasions, Jesus even addresses the Pharisees and he says, you have no faith. 
That's a level of faith because there is no faith. (laughs) And in this particular instance, Jesus says to Peter, you have little faith, which is a level of faith. Different seasons in our lives can demand different levels of faith from us. Right, And sometimes God might give you this word or or, or this dream and it's so big and you're going, God, I don't even know how I'm going to get there. You might actually not recognise you're being called to operate at this higher level of faith, right? And um, apologies, I've I've gone a bit stuck on my notes, but anyway. (laughs) Yeah, so that's right. So like I was mentioning before, it might take someone that God might need to send into your life to recognise, hey, there's a possibility here for my friend to step into this higher level of faith. Think about the friends who lowered their paralysed friend through a roof to meet Jesus where he could encounter their miracle. The people that God sends into your life who are operating at a higher level than you, they will posture you to step into the possibility of operating at a higher level of faith. But why would they do that? When God loves you so much that he assigns someone into your life to unlock a level of uncommon faith, you're going to have to recognize it as uncommon, right? Because that gap in the faith that you're missing, that is what is going to lead you to your next miracle. I want to explain this a little bit further. Let's say, for example, you're uh, battling unforgiveness right now and you're being pretty stubborn about it, but you have enough faith to believe that God can shift your perspective and bring you to a place of forgiveness. But you might not have the level of faith to believe that potentially God might be able to physically, miraculously heal you of maybe a physical ailment. The gap between your current level of faith and where God is trying to take you is what I like to call uncommon faith. So people that God sends into your life who are operating at this level, they're going to silence doubt and instead speak to that uncommon faith that God is calling you to step into. You see, a couple of years ago... um, I went through this season, actually not a couple of years, a lot more than that. I went through this season where I was so desperate to speak in the gift of tongues, right? I really, really wanted it uh, because I'd seen the impact that it had on, you know, other Christians, how much more they're hearing, like hearing God, it was at a whole nother level. And so I really, really wanted it, but I was not at a point in my life, I didn't have the faith to believe that I would actually receive it because I thought it was reserved for some of the most elite of elite Christians, Right. And so I kept, I prayed, but then I got to a point where I'm like, look, I'm just going to give up praying for this. And it felt like it was in the nick of time that God sent a couple of beautiful girlfriends into my life. And they started sharing their testimonies of how they had received the gift of tongues. Right. And so it started instilling faith in me to the point I started to believe, hang on, the word of God says that the gift of tongues is available to all. And the word of God says to earnestly desire the gifts of the spirit. So I began to believe it and declare it in faith. And I remember one night we were sort of hanging out and then casually at the car park, it turned into a bit of a prayer session. They're going for it in tongues and I'm just standing here like praying. We're praying for different things. And suddenly the Holy Spirit came on me and this beautiful heavenly language started to flow out, right? And to this day, glory to God, yes, to this day. I love that the gift of tongues is a part of my prayer life. It has seriously increased my hearing with God. And man, the people that God sends into your life, they are a gift. And a side note, community is a gift from God. And you will know when something is a gift from God because it will never replace, but it will always encourage the presence of God in your life. And, and when God sends people into your life to unlock a level of uncommon faith in you, a lot of the times they might not have the personality type that you're used to generally doing life with. They might not look like the people that you're generally doing life with used to doing life with but if you are not prepared with the help of the Holy Spirit to recognize it because you only recognize or you are only more open to receiving what you are prepared to recognize number two true Christian community will only build the kingdom of God we're living in times right in the 21st century postmodern culture where there seems to be such an obsession with being successful and and such an obsession with people's talents and the gifts on their lives. And what that tends to do in the body of Christ and in the church is there can be a temptation sometimes to put an overemphasis on our purpose in Christ over intimacy with Christ himself. You can have the heart and desire to build, build the kingdom of God, but if you don't know the heart of the king himself, what kingdom are you trying to build? Your own kingdom and your own empire coming from a place of ambition or the kingdom of God coming from a place of intimacy with Jesus Christ? I don't know about you, right, but it's taken me a while. But finally, I'm at a point in my life where when my time is up and I stand in front of the Lord and He holds me to account, 
I do not want him to say what he warned his disciples about in Matthew 7, to 23. This is what Jesus said. He said, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles. Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evil doers. From that verse, clearly, Jesus is not impressed by the gifts that he himself has given you. He gave them to you for free. You didn't have to earn it. Great, if he's given you the gift of strong prophecy, great. Go prophesy, led by the Holy Spirit. If he's given you a gift of leadership, great. Go be a leader where he's called you to and build his kingdom. But what does move the heart of God is not the gift he's given you, but it is a heart that is completely sold out for him and that only comes to him to receive his instructions on how to build his kingdom. It's his kingdom, it's not yours. He's the only one that can give you instructions. And side note, don't get instructions from God confused with wise counsel. Wise counsel comes from the people that God sends into your life and is coming from a place of advice and experience. Instructions only come from God. One comes from a place of experience. The other comes from a place of Holy Spirit-led revelation. And I love what Proverbs 16.20 talks about or brings light to in terms of what it means to receive instruction from God. It says, Whoever gives heed to instruction prospers, and blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord. Your purpose in Christ will automatically thrive and succeed as long as you keep going to the purpose giver for instructions. And, you know, I love that as Christians, right, we can be called to all spheres of our communities. If God's given you a heart for social work, great, build his kingdom there in tune with his voice. If God's called you to be a leader in the corporate field, great, be a light in that field and do his work according to how he's leading you. But be aware and take heed that your ambition doesn't take the place of intimacy in Jesus Christ. The people that God sends into your life and the community that he calls you to be in, they will never exalt who who you are in Christ over who Christ is in your life. And number three, true Christian community will not be afraid to move in the spirit and power of God. I love how the early church did this brilliantly and there is so much we can learn from the early church. In Acts chapter four, when Peter and John, they'd heal this man, right? And they get chucked into prison by the Pharisees and elders. And now they've been released and they come back and they're reporting everything that's happened to the believers, to the early church. And I love that their first response was to pray. But in Acts chapter 4, verses 29 to 31, pay pretty close attention to how they pray, right? This is what they say. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. I love that as the church, and when I mean church, I'm talking about the church Australia-wide. I love that as a church, we are so hungry for revival, right? You might have heard this word revival being thrown around pretty loosely over the last year or so. And if you don't know what it means, essentially what revival means in the church context, it means to make alive again what has gone a bit cold or is in a hibernating state. That's not saying the church is dead. What that is saying is to restore the spiritual vigour back to the church that is completely led by the Holy Spirit. So I love that as the church, we are so hungry for revival and we even recognise that revival begins with us. And so we've got all the foundations right. But here's the thing. In our close circles, maybe it's in your community of three, your close three, your close five, maybe it's in your life groups. If you're so hungry for revival and you're not doing anything about it, what's stopping you from doing something about it? You recognise that it begins with you, right? It's almost as if every time I speak to people uh, about revival, it's almost as if we're waiting on, you know, one or two big spirit-filled people or a handful of big giants to come in and cause this wave of the Holy Spirit across Australia and we're expecting it to remain without having to do anything about it. Yet we recognise that revival begins with us. As the church, we need to be taking, if you are already doing this, incredible. But if you're not, as the church, we need to be taking active steps to move in the power of the Holy Spirit like it's normal, like it was normal for the early church. When Peter and John came back and reported everything that happened, the first response of the early church was to pray and the key was how they prayed. They called on the presence and power of God to move in a situation and bring breakthrough, right? 
I don't know. Maybe you've walked in here, right? And maybe you've come from a previous community, a previous group of friends. Maybe you're looking for a new church and you're going, Sunny, like, I don't know if I 100% believe in the power of God thing that you're talking about. Like, yes, I believe in the gospel. I believe that Jesus came and he died for our sins and in him there is salvation. And I even believe that he moved in the spirit and power of God. And I even believe the apostles did. But are you sure it's for today, Sonny? Are you sure we can all do that? Or unfortunately, you might have had a bad experience with something in the past. And you're going, look, I've had a bad experience. And now every time someone even shares, you know, a, a miracle story where God's moved in power, my first response, unfortunately, is to doubt and come from a place of skepticism. And unfortunately, you're here in this place of deception. And I want to tell you that's a lie. In 1 Thessalonians 1.5, the Apostle Paul, he summarizes the nature of the gospel of Jesus Christ in one powerful verse. And he says this, Because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit and a deep conviction. You see, the gospel of Jesus Christ is a demonstrated gospel. Jesus came with two things. He came with the message of salvation and he demonstrated that message of salvation through God's power to prove God's existence with signs, wonders, healings and miracles. And if you believe in the word of God, but you're doubting the power of God, but you believe in the word of God, you would know that the same power that raised Christ from the dead lives in you, which means every one of us have the capacity and capability to move in the spirit and power of God. The early church showed us how to do it. There's a specific way to pray. Man, I am so grateful to God that growing up and even to this day, I have a close three, close five that keep me cognizant to this truth of the power of God. And I remember a couple of years ago, it's probably actually close to three years now, I went through a season in my life where I had chronic pain in all my joints to the point where I couldn't do this. What you're seeing right now, I couldn't do. I couldn't bend my knees. I was in pain. It was affecting my work. I couldn't go anywhere and the doctors couldn't figure out what was wrong. Right, and I remember I went to a prayer session and I encountered the power of God and instantly the pain left my body. And I stand here as a witness today to tell you that the power of God is real. It is for everyone. It's not just reserved for the most elite of elite Christians. You don't have to run always to a crusade or a revival meeting to encounter the power of God. You can tap into the Holy Spirit who lives in you. And I don't know, maybe as I'm speaking to you right now, something is resonating with you and you're going, look, man, I've had this desire to move in the Spirit, but I've always been held back. People have always discouraged me from that. I want to encourage you, find yourself in a group of three, a group of five. Find your people that don't dismiss the power of God, that don't ignore the power of God and that don't relegate the power of God to some last resort, but instead make space and room for the power of God to move. Because it is only the power of God that can break spiritual yokes and bondages where human strength can't. And so I want to give us one quick how-to before I close today on how, and how to live in true Christian community and encounter the power of God where hopefully a contagious revival fire breaks out. Find one person. Ideally, they'd be in your close circle or it could be someone that you're discipling with and pray with them for something specific that you're believing for in breakthrough. It's either for you or them and do it for 10 minutes once a week. Right, And as you are praying, I want you to meditate on Acts chapter 4, verses 29 to 31 to learn how they prayed. They prayed with boldness and authority. They declared the promises of God in alignment with His Word and exercised the authority of Christ within them. If you watch how they pray, they say, stretch out your hand, God, and heal them. Father God, enable us to speak with boldness. That is how you pray, to call on the presence and power of God to bring breakthrough in a situation. And let me tell you, I recently started doing this with a friend. I've done this several times with other friends overseas. And let me tell you, when you experience a supernatural hand of God like that, you will never go back. By the way, this does not replace your quiet time with God. You've still got to do that every day. This is just an addition to it. And I want to encourage you, don't stop until you start to see something happen. It could take months, it could take weeks, but God will move in a way only He can and remove all expectations. It might not always be an earth-shattering experience, but God will move. Amen. God bless you. Father, I lift up each and every person. God, thank you for the word that we have received. I pray, God, that we find that one person, that we go into deeper community with them. And I pray, God, that you release your power, release breakthrough in situations, bring revelation and turn around situations supernaturally in a way only you can, Lord God. I give you all the glory. In Jesus' name, everyone said, Amen. Amen.